It may surprise you to learn that I don't watch a lot of beauty pageants, but I don't. However, there is one particular beauty pageant that stands out in my mind, the 2015 Miss Universe pageant, and it sticks in my mind for all the wrong reasons. At the climax of the show, there were two contestants left, Miss Columbia and Miss Philippines. These two women had made it through all of the events, all the pageant events, and now they were waiting on stage with bated breath to hear who would be crowned Miss Universe. Steve Harvey was the host, and he made his way back to the stage. And he comes to the forefront to declare who the winner will be. He announces to the crowd of millions of people watching, hundreds gathered in the room, that the new Miss Universe, Miss Universe 2015, would be, and there was a dramatic pause with overly dramatic music being played, but finally, the pause was broken. Miss Columbia, that's right, Miss Columbia is the 2015 winner of the Miss Universe pageant. And she becomes emotional. She's clearly thrilled that all of her hard work has led to this moment. Her dreams, her aspirations of winning this pageant have all come true. And now she is crowned with all the power it bestows Miss Universe. And she gets to celebrate that victory for two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Because after about two and a half minutes, Steve Harvey returns to the stage and he has a look of fear upon his face. He apologizes to the women on the stage. He apologizes to the crowd and all those watching and says, guys, I read the card wrong. Miss Columbia is not actually the winner. She's the first runner up. Miss Universe 2015 is Miss Philippines. And that moment... Everything changed for these women. Their, their reality is completely upended as one literally had the crown taken off her head that was just placed there two minutes ago and placed on the woman that she thought she had beaten. I'm sure she was devastated to learn this turn of events while the other who thought she had lost now feels the joy, the exuberation of an unexpected Victory. It's one of the most memorable reversals of fortune in, in recent pop culture history. And it kept coming to my mind this week as I read our passage in the book of Esther. Because this morning, we will read about another great reversal. A greater reversal of fortune that has far-reaching consequences, not only in the story of Esther, but for all of redemptive history. See, as we finish Esther chapter 5 and work our way into Esther chapter 6 this morning, things look really bad for Mordecai. It seems like his enemy Haman is going to win. He's going to get his wish for Mordecai's destruction sooner rather than later. And everything that we read in the book leading to this moment leads us to think that there is little hope for Mordecai the Jew. And as a consequence, little hope for the whole of his people. But something incredible happens. Really a, a series of seemingly normal, unrelated events that forge together completely up in this story and lead to an unexpected victory. You see, God providentially orchestrates a greater reversal in the story of Esther that not only saves the life of Mordecai, but the whole of the people of Israel, preserving God's covenant promise to them. And this great reversal that we read about in the story of Esther right here in the middle of the book of Esther is dripping with gospel hope. Because through the story, we are reminded of the greater story of scripture and the greater surprising victory that God has offered to, to us through the work of, of Christ. And here's what I hope that we will rejoice in church as we have gathered around this, this word. I want us to rejoice in this incredible truth that we will see coming off, leaping off of the page of Esther 5 and 6 this morning. The gospel of Jesus Christ ensures a greater reversal, a great reversal that leads to our deliverance and our enemy's defeat. I want you to see your story and the story of Mordecai and Haman today, knowing that in Christ, the kind of reversal that we see flooding off the page can be true of your story as well. Let's see how the Bible leads us to this place of ultimate rejoicing by, by 
beginning in chapter 5. Listen, I want to work through our text a little bit differently this morning. I want to focus on four different stages of this story that evidence the great reversal we're going to rejoice in today. So let's begin with the first stage, clearly. And in the first stage of our passage, we once again are given a window into the mind of Haman, who is the enemy of God's people in this story. And in particular, the author wants us to see the dangerous pride of Haman. Because it is this dangerous pride that is driving all of Haman's actions, all of his desires toward Mordecai and the people of God. As we begin reading in verse 9, it's important to remember that Haman has just attended the first banquet that Esther had organized for Ahasuerus herself and Haman, and he has been invited to the second. And all that takes place from 5-9 through chapter 6 takes place between these two banquets. And look at what happens as Haman leaves the first banquet and begins to head the banquet and begins to head home. Again in verse 9 of Esther 5. Haman went out that day, joyful, glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And, and he sent and, and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which a king had honored him and how he had advanced him above all the officials and servants of the king. And Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast that she prepared. And tomorrow I'm invited again together with the king. Yet all of this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. And his wife Zeresh and all the friends said to him, Well, let a gallow, some 50 cubits high, be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea pleased Haman, and he made the gallows. In the beginning of our passage, Haman is filled with joy. How could he not be? He received an invitation that no one else in the kingdom, aside from the king himself, had received. And more than that, he gets another invitation to the exact same kind of feast the next day. And the Bible describes him leaving this feast of honor as if he's in some sort of Disney cartoon. He's skipping home. He's probably singing some sort of melody that expresses the joy that he feels in his heart until, dun, 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 he sees Mordecai. And suddenly all that joy all that joy is robbed because his pride is offended. Mordecai continues to disregard Haman, seemingly the only person in the whole of the city that treats Haman this way. And Haman simply cannot stand it. He's filled with wrath, the Bible says in verse 9. And so he goes, he goes home sulking and he gathers his close friends and his wife to console him. He begins to, to count to them, recount to them his own greatness, seemingly surprised that Mordecai can't see how great he is. You see this in verses 11 to 12. I'm really rich. I got all these sons. I'd have, I'd have every promotion you can imagine to the point where I'm second in command of the whole kingdom. I even got invited. Even the queen recognizes my greatness. She invited me to this feast and she invited me to the feast tomorrow. Everybody sees how great I am except Mordecai. What am I going to do about him? Because he represents a threat, a threat to my, my place in the kingdom. But really what he represents is a threat to the way that Haman views himself. What a devastating picture of the emptiness of human pride that we see in Haman. Haman's pride is built upon the shakiest of foundations. See, pride leads him to find pleasure in himself and his own achievements. And to sustain that pleasure in himself, he needs others to acknowledge it as well. And the whole city seems to honor him in this way. But he's so insecure about his place. He's so inconsistent. Uh, Insecure about his standing in this city that one Jewish man can steal that temporary joy and all the joy of the earthly confirmations that his, his greatness, his so-called greatness bring. 
Haman's pride is so wounded by Mordecai's actions that he has to go home and convince himself with the help of his wife and friends that he really is that great. And you have to ask yourself, what kind of man child is this? Sounds like a kid, wounded, running home. And what kind of power does he actually have? Second in the command of the kingdom and yet subject to the whims of one man. This is what happens when you build your life, when you establish your joy upon the the way other people speak or view you or the way that you view yourself because of a false sense of who you are, exaggerated pride. And to prove himself that his glory, his greatness is all that he thinks it is, Haman exacts a more immediate plan for Mordecai's Destruction, And this brings us to the next stage of our story where we discover the destructive plans of this wounded enemy. Verse 14, what advice does Haman receive from his wife, from his friends to deal with this threat to the view of himself? Get rid of Mordecai, they say. Hey, why don't you build the the largest gallows imaginable, 75 feet high, And why don't you hang this disrespectful man upon it? Let the gallows be a testament to your greatness that in one night you could build these 75 foot gallows and then as a warning to the rest of the city, if anybody wants to treat me like Mordecai has treated me, then you're gonna be hung on these very same gallows. It seemed the planned destruction that Haman had for Mordecai that initially was reserved for the future has been expedited. Haman wants this guy gone ASAP. And he orders the construction of these gallows to begin. And this is the low point in the story of Esther. It seems like Mordecai is going to die. And in all likelihood, all of his people along with him, the plans formulated in pride by this wounded enemy it seems like are going to prevail unless some person, something, someone intervenes. Mordecai will be lost, but something happens. Interesting. Interesting happens in chapter six. In fact, several interesting somethings happen that set in motion the third and pivotal stage of our story as we see the divine providence of God on full display. We read about several normal enough events through which God providentially begins to move. As we've said, although he is not explicitly mentioned, the name of God is not explicitly mentioned in the book of Esther, we see his hand all over the pages of Esther chapter 6. What we're going to confront, what we're going to see in the next 11 verses is the divine providence of God confronting the pride of Haman and confounding his destructive plans. Let's read these first 11 verses of Esther 6 and see how God begins to intervene to turn what should have been a tragedy into a story of salvation. On that night, that very same night, when Haman's at home planning the destruction of Mordecai, on that same night, the king couldn't sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds to the uh, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, hey, what honor or distinction has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended said, nothing has been done for him. And the king said, well, who is in the court? Now Haman, turn to your neighbor and say, now Haman. Now Haman had just entered, imagine, had just entered the court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai honored, no, hanged on the gallows that he had been prepared, that he'd been preparing for him. And the king's young men told him, well, Haman's here. He's standing out in the court. And the king said, well, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, bursting forth with pride, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let's do this. Let let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, 
and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a, a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. Let them lead him on the horse to the square of the city, proclaiming, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes, the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes, he took the horse, and he dressed Mordecai. He led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. After 6 verse 1, the king could not sleep. Now in the Old Testament, you need to know that this is not just a, a case of insomnia. When kings don't sleep in the scripture, that often means that God is at work. Similar to what happens in the story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar can't sleep. The Bible says that sleep left him because God had given him dreams. And it's through those dreams, those troubled dreams that Nebuchadnezzar needed to be interpreted, that God positions Daniel and his three friends into their positions of influence in the Babylonian empire. So God took away sleep from Nebuchadnezzar on purpose. And the same thing is happening here. Ahasuerus can't sleep because the Lord is stirring, stirring him. And that's not all that God does. Let's think for a moment about all that just so happens that take place as this, this passage unfolds. It just so happens, again in verse 1 of chapter 6, the king calls for the book of memorable deeds to be read from the Chronicles. Because if you've got a case of insomnia, I can't think of a better thing to put you to sleep than reading the Chronicles. And it just so happens that the king's men open the page to an event that takes place some five years earlier. And it just so happens that the subject of those events that took place five years earlier happens to be Mordecai. And it just so happens that when the king asks, hey, what have we done to honor this guy Mordecai, that his men know that nothing had been done to this point to honor Mordecai. And it just so happens that when the king begins to think about who could be the one, who could be the instrument of honor to make sure that uh, Mordecai is honored in the way that he deserves. It just so happens that when the king is looking, Haman walks through the door at that exact right moment. I think we all know as a people of God that all of these things didn't just happen. The divine providence of God happened. God is directing all these human events to bring about his desired outcome. And by the way, the author of Esther wants you to see this. He's intentionally taking the focus away from human activity to point you to divine activity. I mean, how many restless, sleepless nights have you had in your life? And, God, and yet God uses this one in the life of a king to set in motion a series of events that will alter the course of the whole people. That's the power that, that God has to do the extraordinary and what we think is ordinary. God oversees every movement of man and he can take Every decision that we make, either good or bad, and by his grace, use them for his glory and our good. And all this divine activity builds to the final stage of this part of our story, the deserved prostration, the deserved humiliation of Haman. You know, the Bible tells us, you've probably heard this before, in Proverbs sixteen eighteen that pride goes before destruction. That a haughty spirit goes before a fall. And have those words ever been better illustrated than what we're reading here in Esther 6? There's an incredible moment of irony in Esther 6, again, fueled by the pride of Haman. When the king asks Haman how, we should, how he should honor the one in whom the king delights, verse 6, Haman says, well, who else on earth? If there's one person in this kingdom that the king would delight in honoring, it's got to be me. And so Haman begins to describe how he would want to be honored. And it's a bold request. In fact, there are some commentators that say that Haman's request is borderline treasonous. Here's why. Because Haman is essentially describing his fantasy to be king. To wear the, the king's robe and ride the king's horse. That's a big deal. It was said that the, the horse of the king was a movable throne. 
under normal circumstances, anyone that mounted the king's horse, they would see that as a threat because they were making a declaration that they wanted the throne of the king to usurp it for themselves. So understand what Haman is asking here. He's asking to be seen by the whole city as on equal footing with the king. He just doesn't know that all that he's asking for himself will be given to his rival, Mordecai, and that's the irony. Consider the great reversal here and the story that we're reading, friends. Haman comes to the court to seek the destruction of Haman, but instead he is commanded to be the instrument of his unparalleled honor. Everything he desired for himself, he now has to give to his enemy. Moreover, he has to walk Mordecai through the streets of Susa and lead the people to give him the praise that Haman thinks he deserves. Quite a different spectacle than Haman had planned. He wanted, he wanted Mordecai to be paraded as a word of warning to what happens when you offend Haman. But now he's got to lead him on the king's horse and the king's clothes or the king's crown saying, this is what happens when you honor the king. So the Bible tells us, verse 12, that because he had to give all the honor that he thought was due himself to his enemy, he returns home humiliated, mourning with his head, his head covered. And his wife and friends, they add to the offense because in verse 13, they finally speak truth to him. Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all the friends what happened his wise men and his wife said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. The very one that you've spent countless hours, devised countless plans to make bow before you, you're going to bow before him. It seems as though the destruction that Haman desires for Mordecai to receive will actually be given to him. What a compelling story. And what an important story for us to think about as the people of God. Remember, as we walk through the story of Esther, we are, we are clinging to the promise of Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And here's what that, that passage says. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through encouragement, through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have Hope. And so what we're asking about this passage today is how, is how is Esther 5 and 6 meant to instruct us and encourage us as a people to live with gospel hope? And so what I want to do this morning in our remaining time is offer three encouragements. Three encouragements from this great reversal in Esther that I hope will help us walk in greater faithfulness as the people of God. And the first encouragement is this. Beware the enemy that is pride. Beware the enemy that is pride. Haman is a personification of pride. Beware pride. We talk a lot about obvious sins in the church, sins that are easy to identify and address, many of which we covered in our study of the book of 1 Corinthians, things like divisive issues, gossip, the abuse of spiritual gifts, sexual immorality, playing with idolatrous practices. But it's harder for us to talk about and to deal with the sins that are of the heart. Things like jealousy, greed, pride. But it's important for us to remember that all those outward sins that we like to focus on usually are symptoms of the rot that can exist in our hearts when we cultivate sin and make gods of ourselves. Pride is a dangerous enemy because pride sets us at odds with God. Pride makes us an enemy of God because we are seeking to find pleasure in ourselves, satisfaction in ourselves, rather than the God who created us. Here's how one author put it. Pride is a form of dishonesty that gives us a false view of our own importance. It's frequently the substitution and exaltation of ourselves in the place of God. And is there a worse form of idolatry than that, church? Pride makes us think that we deserve what God has graciously given to us. Pride makes us think that we are better than we are, better than those around us, and that we are worthy of the people around us telling us, ascribing to us that glory when all that glory is really only God's. But pride, friends, has no place, no place among the people of God. 
Pride has no place among those who claim to be of Christ and desire to be more like him. There is not an ounce of pride in Jesus. There couldn't be because he is in fact worthy of all man's praise. He is truly, incomparably great. But in spite of that actual greatness, how the Bible says that he was equal with God, what did Jesus do? He humbled himself. Humbled himself. He took on the form of a servant, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that in honor of that humility at the exact right time, the Father would honor him. The Father would give him the name that is above every name that would cause every knee to bow and tongue to confess. Jesus didn't have to do that for himself. God gave it to him. Jesus was temporarily humiliated by his enemies, thinking that they had defeated him so that at the exact right time, God could raise him up and honor him and show the enemy who was truly defeated. Listen, humility trusts in who God is, not who we are. And if we're going to boast church, let's boast in Jesus. Let's try, let's strive in our conversations around coffee tables, around our, our dinner tables, in Bible studies, at church. Let's strive in all that we do to not make much of ourselves, but to make much of Christ. Let's spend time talking about his greatness rather than our own. We need to beware of pride. And to, to help this kind of be driven home even more so, let me just offer two places where we can identify if pride is a problem in our hearts that are, that are brought about right from our text today. So firstly, beware of the danger of flattery. Flattery. Let me ask you, do you need the approval and blessing of others? Is there ever an opportunity for them to speak truth into your life? Or is your view of yourself so fragile that you need people to only affirm what you think about yourself rather than what God has said about you? This is really important, friends, because as, as Christians, we're called to be like Christ, not to be better versions of ourselves. We're called to become like Jesus. And the reality is that all of us have places in our lives that do not align with who Christ is. Places in our heart that are out of alignment with God's heart. And we need to have those places revealed. It's good for us. We should delight in that being brought to our attention. And there are two primary ways where God does that. And the first is, of course, his word. As we sit before the word of God, as we sit before the mirror of God's word, what happens is that we see the, the brokenness of man on the pages of the scripture, but we also see the, the purity and the, the holiness of Christ. And the, the Holy Spirit uses that revelation to show us that the mirror of scripture where that brokenness exists in our own life and how we need to get that out so that we can look more like Jesus. And that is good for us. It is good for us. Why? Because true joy, true happiness is found when we are in connection with God, when we are related to God in perfect harmony, and we will never be more rightly related to God than we are when we are looking more and more like Jesus. It's a benefit for us. But here's the problem. Sometimes when you've been walking with Jesus a long time, I've been walking with Jesus for over 30 years now. Some of you have been walking with Jesus even longer than that. Sometimes we can think that we've arrived. Right, that old statement, he's still working on me. Well, he ain't got nothing left to work on. I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I'm not, I'm not out there sinning. I'm not out there running over people. I'm, like, I'm, I'm doing fine. Like, I'm, I'm pretty good. So I don't think that I need the scripture to speak into areas where I need to grow. I don't need conviction. I don't need repentance. And that's a dangerous lie of the enemy. Because it, it fuels self-righteousness. It fuels the kind of pride that we're guarding against. Listen, friends. Until the day we arrive in glory, because we live in a broken and fallen world, there will be places in our lives that need to be conformed to the image of Christ. Are we willing to allow the scripture to have that kind of access into our hearts? And by the way, not only scripture, but also our community of faith. It's the second way that God speaks into these places in our heart through close relationships. Imagine the difference that could have happened in Haman's life if his friends and his wife had spoken the truth the first time. But do you allow 
people to speak into your life this way, where they notice something that's out of alignment with Jesus, that's a part of your heart that's not completely surrendered to the Lordship of Christ? Do you have anybody in your life that can speak that truth? Now, I know some of us will say, no, I, Jerry, Jer, I really do want people to be able to speak that into my life. I want to know if there's a place in my life that doesn't look like Christ. But if you're being honest, you know that if somebody really spoke the truth in love, in love, that it would completely deflate your view of who you are. And yes, yeah, what God's called us to. We, we need to have these places of pride confronted for the glory of God and recognize that there's no greater gift that God can give to us than through his word or through the, the spirit-led loving word of another to show them to us so they can be removed and corrected, replaced by the grace of God. So we need. Are we living in light of that? So beware the danger of flattery. If you can only receive words that affirm who you think you are outside of who God has said you is, uh, you are, there's an issue. There's an issue in your heart. Now, listen, sometimes people speak true things in unhelpful, hurtful ways. But let me also say this. I heard a pastor say one time that my responsibility whenever any kind of critique or criticism comes to me is to place it before the Lord, however it was given, to see if there's any truth in it. Because at the end of the day, my heart's desire is to please him and to be more like him above anything else. So let me just challenge you, church, as we think about, is there, is there pride in our hearts? Is there a place where, where Christ's likeness has not been pursued in the way that it should be? To just commit to being in the kind of community in time before the word that allows the Holy Spirit to have that kind of access to your heart. Because otherwise we'll, we'll stall and our growth towards Christ's likeness. And we'll build versions of ourselves in our head that don't conform into the image of Jesus. And that's a problem. Second, let me also say this. Beware flattery. Also beware the the tendency to want to humiliate those who offend your pride. Another dangerous thing for the community of faith is that if, if someone does have the courage and is led by the Spirit to speak something into your life, if you're not in a and a posture of humility or spirit readiness to receive that, our flesh kick can be, who do you think you are? And don't you know who I am? And because you said that to me, I want to see you destroyed. That's what happened in the life of, of Haman. Led to Mordecai. Listen, again, we need to recognize the gift of the people of God. And if someone is, is with prayerfulness and boldness, willing to come and point out something to us, if your wife or your husband is willing to say in humility, I love you and I want to speak this to you, we've got to have the maturity, the Christian maturity to say thank you. Otherwise, we're building the, our, our view of ourselves on the wrong thing. So church, beware, beware pride. Secondly, in terms of our encouragements, our second of three encouragements, let's rest in the providence of God. A central theme of the book of Esther is the providence of God. That that God, in some invisible, inscrutable way, governs all creatures, actions, circumstances through the normal, ordinary course of human life without the intervention of miracles to accomplish his glorious end. And that theme is no more visible than it is right here in our passage today. We need to make sure that we see the providence of God on display and receive the encouragement that is intended for us because it was written down. What happens here and and the deliverance, the incredible deliverance that God orchestrates for Mordecai and his people, it's not the result of Esther's actions. Esther's barely mentioned in this passage. It's not the result of Mordecai. Mordecai has no idea how close he is to death. And it's not the result of Ahasuerus' actions either. He just couldn't sleep one night. It's clear that what happens here is because God was at work. Here's how one commentator describes the providence of God on display in our passage. Our God is so great, so powerful, that he can work without miracles through the ordinary events of billions of human lives through millennia of time to accomplish his eternal purposes and ancient promises. 
God delivered an entire race of people in Persia because the king had a sleepless night, because a man would not bow to his superior, because a woman found herself taken to the bedroom of a ruthless man for a night of pleasure. How inscrutable are the ways of the Lord. I hope this gives you comfort, this action of God, this providence of God, because there are so many things that are happening in this world that seem beyond our control and that can bring us great grief. The world feels like it's been out of control even more today than ever. The Middle East and Ukraine, the culture wars that are present even in the Olympics, our political landscape here in the United States, our exile feels weightier than ever before. But remember, Everything that concerns us is not beyond the control of God. As my pastor said, growing up, what is over our head is under his feet. And that should bring us incredible comfort. And so there's a prayer that Paul David Tripp has offered that I think helps me. And I think will help you prepare to live in light of the providence of God. It's three basic statements that I want to offer you today to help us live in light and to rest in the providence of God. Here they are. Lord, this is the first statement. I'm a, I'm a person in desperate need of help today. I need you to help me today. Secondly, Lord, won't you in your grace send your helpers my way? I need your help. I need to send your helpers, your people to help me. And then thirdly, Lord, give me the humility to receive that help when it comes. And when we pray those kind of prayers, here's what happens. As one writer put it. When we daily prepare ourselves to receive God's loving help in unexpected ways through unexpected people, perhaps even through suffering and hardship, that kind of preparation open our, opens our eyes to see the loving activity of his hand in every circumstance. We are watching for God's fatherly hand on purpose. We are resting in divine providence. Church, we need to live like Joseph lived. Remember when we did the study of Joseph, the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis? where Joseph said two things that were absolutely true. My brother sold me into slavery and God sent me into Egypt. Can we live with that kind of divine providence in mind that everything's happening for a reason around us, that there are, there are human actions around us that take place, but God can providentially work in all of them to accomplish his divine purposes. That's how we rest in the providence of God. Thirdly, our final encouragement, let's rejoice and the great reversal of our own story. Let's rejoice in the great reversal of our story. This part of the story of Esther speaks to the larger story of Scripture and the great reversal, the greater reversal that God has, for, has secured for us in Jesus. You see, church, we were facing certain death, yet unaware of how imminent our destruction was. Our enemy had captured us in our own pride, and we had no means of escape. Everyone who is watching this story unfold, it looked to them as if their enemy was winning the day. But our story was not finished because God's story was not finished. Through a seemingly simple act, a normal, commonplace act, the birth of a baby, a series of events was set in motion, connected to a larger story that God had been writing for the whole of time that would change the course of human history. Jesus came. He took on flesh to dwell among us. He lived the life that we could not live. He perfectly fulfilled the law of God. He sought to bring the kingdom of, of God upon the earth, and he did. He took our place upon the cross all the while the enemy was plotting against him. And the enemy raised up opponents, blinded them in their sin to Jesus' glory and used them to portray Jesus and put him to death on that cross that we deserved. It seemed in that moment on that Good Friday that Satan had gotten the victory, that he would receive the honor from man that was solely due our creator. But in a, a moment of unparalleled glory, Jesus was raised out of that grave, securing our victory in the face of certain defeat. What the enemy thought was our moment of destruction turned out to be his. And we as the people of God today can now step into the full promise and blessing of God beginning now, a salvation that begins now, but hear me, will last for all of eternity. Praise be to God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Glad 
that God is working behind the scenes and has been working throughout all of history to secure our salvation. Aren't you glad that he made a way to reverse our story, reverse our trajectory to to defeat an eternal separation from God and yet give us an unexpected victory in Christ? That's the kind of God we serve. So friends, have you experienced this great reversal in your life? Have you repented and believed in Jesus, humbling yourself, recognizing that there's nothing in your own ability that can save you, that can get you out of this future of destruction, crying out to him and help? Have you ever done that and seen that he is willing and desirous to save? If not, let today be the day of your salvation. We'll have some some pastors here in the front who would love to pray with you and encourage you. If you need to, to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, Give yourself to Christ. And if you have, if you have given yourself to Christ, would you rest in the providence of God and rejoice in the work of God, the great reversal of God in such a way that it leads you to live your life in complete dependence upon him and dedication completely to his glory. Wherever you are, you bow your heads. We want to spend some time this morning in a kind of a a longer season of prayer. Because of the need to give the Spirit space to work in our hearts through His Word, specifically in this area of pride. Again, if if you're not a follower of Jesus, your pride, as Pastor Brad Brad said earlier, can lead you to want to reject the author of offer of salvation that Christ has has given in Jesus. And would you ask the Spirit of God to help you resist that, that lie that you can save yourself, that your actions are enough. You don't need a Savior. And would you come in repentance today? And if we are in Christ... Are we completely in alignment with Jesus? As we think about the testimony of who Christ is, the testimony of the word, as we think about our relationships, are there places in our life that don't look like Christ, that we have not surrendered to the lordship of Christ? Because we find joy in those places outside of Jesus, even though it's temporary and won't last. Would you ask the Spirit to again search your heart as we've already prayed and to reveal those places? Confess them. And ask them to to fill those holes with His grace. And again, if you want to come up here and pray at the altars, we want to offer those to you. These, These steps can be an altar for you, and we would love to pray with you or over you if you need that today. And as you confess and as you repent, Just remember that this is all part of God's plan to help you be conformed to the image of the Son. Part of his his work to reverse your trajectory from condemnation and destruction to honor eternity with him. Father, would you help us delight in you well today? Help us Rejoice in what you have done and continue in that work as you root out pride. And lead us to a place of greater faithfulness. Thank you for this great reversal. May we evidence it for your glory and our good, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand and respond as the Lord leads? Thank you for joining us this week at Bayleaf. For more information about Bayleaf Baptist Church, visit our website at bayleaf.org.